thank you to everyone who has joined us uh, for this second uh, in our pandemic parenting community solutions uh, listening sessions. The theme of this one is when homeroom is home, what's been lost during remote learning and how to tell. Uh, and this uh, event is part of the Sentinel's ongoing pandemic parenting series. Uh, which is funded by a competitive grant through the Solutions Journalism Network. Uh, and these uh, series of three events are being co-hosted by the Monadnock United Way's Impact Monadnock and Impact Monadnock Business Ambassadors. So a big thank you to uh, everyone who has made tonight's event possible. Uh, just uh, before we jump in, a bit of logistics uh, for anyone uh, who does have questions at any time uh, throughout uh, the event, please uh, put your question in the chat. I'll be monitoring it uh, and we'll ask it. Uh, it. Both our speakers have said they're fine with uh, with uh, questions on the, the topics they're talking about as they're talking about them. So we'll... Uh, We'll get those questions answered in a, in a timely fashion. Um, and just know too that we will open it up towards the end of the conversation for uh, more general Q&A as well. Um, with that, I would ask everyone uh, to keep yourselves on mute uh, while our speakers are presenting. And, uh, and uh, again, just put your questions uh, in the chat, which I will be monitoring. So. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Amanda Bastoni. Amanda is actually a former Sentinel uh, writer and photographer, um, and for the last 12 years, 12 plus years, has been working in education, currently works as an educational research scientist at CAST, uh, which is an educational nonprofit based in the Boston area, uh, dedicated to uh, expanding access uh, to education for all children. And uh, Amanda, uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Jack. I did put the link to the slides that I'm going to share today uh, in the chat. So if anyone wants to check out, there's some resources that I'll share with people. Um, and uh, we'll make sure that the link is accessible when you uh, watch this video later as well. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, very quickly, uh, there's some, uh, I did want to say just that I'm a parent, uh, also an educator, um, and the idea today of thinking about learning loss, I do want to say I don't like necessarily working from a deficit model, so, and it's not because I always want to wear rose-colored glasses, it's actually because uh, science does tell us that um, lang the language we use to describe students and their experiences can directly affect their success. And we'll talk about that a little bit, but I will, I will, hint, I will talk about learning loss, but I just kind of wanted to preface it by saying, I'm not sure it's the right model for us to be using. Um, so I was also wondering if people wanted to uh, put their name in the chat or a uh, reason for attending, but let's, let's maybe move on just so we can make sure and get to Christina, our parent, who's gonna be talking with us too, so. Um, okay, so what's been lost during uh, remote learning and how do we tell was kind of the first question, uh, Jack, that, every, that you sent to me. So I do want to say that we, we know unequivocally that live school is better than the alternative, right? And that uh, for the least advantaged children, they are at the greatest risk of falling behind when they can't attend in person. So, you know, I don't want to pretend like that isn't true um, in any way. But I want to think a little bit more broadly about what's lost during COVID or what we lost. You know, we lost physical contact. Parents lost jobs, so that's security. We lost normalcy. I think everyone <laughs> lost that. Um, some kids lost their hopes and dreams, right? If they played sports or they wanted to have their graduation in person. Uh, and some people lost loved ones, right? So the losses aren't, aren't just relate, although they're related to learning, uh, they aren't necessarily exactly learning losses, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then what can co compound this effect is socioeconomic, socioeconomic disparities, uh, ambiguity, right? Why do I feel this way? Unacknowledged ability to talk about the loss, and then these things kind of pile up. So I guess I just wanted to sort of contextualize what is actually lost. Um, and then I wanted to just say that language is going to have a big effect on how students are going to be able to cope with this learning loss, right? And so the term learning loss is really comes from people who love tests, 
right? Test takers and test designers are really going to be excited in, about what students have lost, but we we don't know. And what's going to be really interesting is to see uh, some students are, are going to keep up just fine, right? And some students are going to have losses in some areas and not in others. So what I did want to just help parents think about is making sure that we have a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Uh, and this is a bit of a discussion from Carol DeWick and really her research, this is a TED talk and, and we don't have to look at it right now, but really her research dives deeply into what happens with students who have growth mindset, students who uh, really believe that they uh, have the ability to uh, tackle adversity uh, those students do exponentially better than students who think that, uh, who have a fixed mindset and who might actually believe I'm either smart, I'm a smart person or I'm a not smart person. I'm good at spelling or I'm bad at spelling. I'm good at math or I'm bad at math. Uh, I've had learning loss or I haven't had learning loss, right? Like that idea is going to become pretty problematic in some ways for kids uh, as, as they move forward in the world. Uh, they can sort of adopt that mentality and think about that them as being a person who's had a learning loss, right? So I just want to surface that a bit. Uh, we're not going to watch this. So given that context, given that we know that, you know, students do learn better in person, but that we want to be careful with the language that we're using, uh, how can we tell what to focus on, right? If we're starting to see some uh, behaviors in our students or our students are exhibiting some uh, behaviors that worry us, like how do we know which ones are important? Well, I'm just going to say it's really important to pay attention to your students. So if upon return to school, uh, they're, they're doing avoidant behaviors, so they're trying to miss school, they're saying they're sick all the time, they don't want to go, really take that into account. If their course completion rate drops dramatically, if their grade point drops dramatically, right, we really we need to focus in on that. We need to pay attention uh, to our students. And I'm just going to give you an example. My my son, during COVID, right, his grades tanked. Uh, in fact, one time I came out of my office where I was working and he was literally watching TV with the with his like laptop on, supposedly in class, you know. So it, they tanked for a lot of reasons. Uh, it was really hard for him to engage. He really struggles with executive functioning. And he was creating a lot of online friendships. I think this was good in some ways, but very bad in other ways. I'm, um, <clears throat> not sure if we knew who those people really were he was friends with online, uh, and he was really struggling with math. My daughter was watching way too much TV during COVID because I was trying to work and my husband was trying to work and we were all home. Uh, she also learned to swear during COVID because she was spending all this time with my 17 year old, uh, and she has had some separation issues. So what I want to say is, you know, learning loss. Uh, is not the term I want to use, but it doesn't mean that we can't acknowledge that something really uh, significant happened during COVID and we do need to address it. I just would like to address it from a non-deficit model. So what can we do as parents? We're concerned about our kids. Uh, we want to help them. Um, I think we need to start by acknowledging that there is no average student, right? So the myth of the average is, is a falsehood. This is a great TED Talk. Uh, Todd Rose talks in this TED Talk, which I've shared. And if you have the bit.ly, you have all the links to these uh, videos that I'm showing. But um, Todd Rose talks in here about how uh, the United States um, was looking to make cockpits. They wanted to design the perfect cockpit so that a fighter pilot could be successful. So they measured everyone's arms and everyone's like height and and, and they figured out what the average person's, you know, what cockpit would fit the, the average person. And, and do you know how many people that cockpit actually fit? That's right, zero. <laughs> because nobody is average, right? Like no one had the average length of arms and the average height and whatever. So what they had to do is they had to design, uh, they had to personalize, they had to design everything in the cockpit so it could be resized and personalized and adjusted. And actually, when they did that, they increased the number of people who could uh, fly the plane. So now we have women flying the planes very successfully. Uh, and, and they were actually able to do it on budget, even though it didn't, it didn't seem like they could at first, right? So all I want to say is let's just remember that learning loss is not going to affect all students in the same way. And there's no average student. So let's just keep that in mind as we think about how to support our kids. Uh, I particularly uh, love and work for an organization that created Universal Design for Learning. You can look that up and I've shared some resources with you on it. 
the goal of universal design for learning is to create expert learners. And that's what I would say parents should really try to focus on right now. You wanna create learners who know how they learn, right? Learners who are purposeful, motivated, resourceful, knowledgeable, and strategic. Because even if there had been no COVID, Students are not going to be fully prepared for every eventuality, right? They're not going to be fully prepared if they want to grow up to be a welder or fully prepared if they go off to college. The best thing we can prepare them to do is know how they learn. We want to make, if we can make expert learners, then we can really set students up for success, irregardless of the pandemic or uh, whatever ex experiences that they've had. It's not to minimize that, it's just to say that really focusing on making, helping kids become expert learners is. Uh, is really, I feel, and research would uh, support the best way to start. So universal design for learning, we're going to skip through this. What I want to just share with you is, uh, I am going to play this video, if that's okay with everyone, it's only three minutes, and it's uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, so he's a very famous astrophysicist and philosopher, and he's going to talk to us about um, uh, sort of this idea of what skills do students really need uh, to have uh, have um, achieved while they're in school, or what should we? Be, how should we be teaching students? And uh, and that the how, not the what, is what's really important. And so, if you bear with me, I'll just you know play this really quick, and then uh, and then I'm almost done, and we can hear from Christina, who I'm sure actually has much more to say than I do. <laughs> so let's just play this really quick. Um, let me get you guys to the right spot. In another example, a little contrived, but it, it brings the point home a little, even a little more strongly. If you're an employer and two candidates come up looking for a job, and this is again a contrived example, and and you're interviewing the two candidates, and and you say, oh, as for part of this interview, I just want to ask you, what's the height of the spire on this building that we're in? And the candidate says, Oh, I was I, I was a I was a uh, an architect. I've majored in architecture for a while, and I memorized the heights of all the buildings on campus. I know the height of that spire is 150 feet. In fact, 155 feet tall. Okay, turns out that's the right answer. That's the right answer. And the person came up with it in seconds. That person goes away, the next candidate walks in. Uh, do you know the height of the spire on this building? The candidate says, no, but I'll be right back. Person runs outside, measures the length of the shadow of that spire on the ground, measures the length of her, her own shadow, ratios the height to the shadows, comes up with a number. Runs back inside, it's about 150 feet. Who are you gonna hire? I'm hiring the person who figured it out, even though it so, you know, he says it so, you know, I like to show this because I like the way he says, he, you know, I'm hiring the person who figured it out. Such a good way to say it. But what I want to say is no one, you know, A, colleges are uh, taking into account that COVID happened, right? If, we, if we're really concerned about our students getting into the right college or something. But what we can still teach students is how they learn. And we did learn a lot about how students learn and they learned a lot about how they learn. Uh, during the during the COVID experience. Um, so uh, one last thing I wanted to do, I, I don't want to just, you know, bore you with research. I kind of am hoping to give you some uh, takeaways, you know, give us something, Amanda, that we can do tonight, right, to help our students, uh, help our kids and help our learners. So do some purpose, purposeful reflection. Go home at the dinner table on a regular basis. We, do, we call it the rose and the thorn. When you go around the table, have students give a rose, what's something positive for their day, a thorn, something that didn't go well, and a bud. So that's something potentially that could go well. Okay, when you get, when you do this, the research, this is research-based guys, but it doesn't matter. What it does is it gets students to reflect, right? And if you can get students to reflect on their learning, you can make them expert learners. Uh, this is my actual son, the math teacher said, what should I know next semester to be a better math teacher? And he said, when students say they don't have any questions, that's probably the time they have the most questions <laughs> and don't understand. Great insight from him. Now I need to talk to him about why he doesn't ask questions, right? So, but, you know, we need to reflect with our students. So that's one thing. Help your kids set up the right learning environment. 
So kids have been learning from their computers. They've been learning from their bedrooms. Now they're going back to school. They're really going to need your help. So I'm, I'm suggesting here you even spend two minutes uh, when they get home just being like, do you have your pencil? Do you have your paper? Where are you going to be learning? Is the TV turned off? Really helping them think through setting up their learning environment and then helping them know that that's what they're doing. So when they get older, they can set up their own learning environments. And then lastly, really focus on mastery oriented feedback. I think a lot of people are going to be, you know, and you can see that I really feel like language is important. Uh, Jack is a former writer. Um, you know, this idea that uh, not talking about it as learning loss, right, is important to me. But then also mastery oriented feedback is feedback that's focused on effort. So let's not, if we, if we just focus on what the students have lost and we just focus on like they're not getting good grades or they're doing bad in math, it's going to be, a, it's going to be setting them up for fit, for not, not good outcomes, right? I'm not saying they were setting them up for failure, but we can do a lot better by our students if we really focus on uh, helping them think about the effort they're putting in. Wow, I can really tell that you are trying hard in math, like good job coming home and doing your homework every day, right? Or come up with a family motto. In our family, we believe success is based on hard work. Say that all the time. Talk about that, right? Um, okay, so last thing, these are my kids. So what I did with my son is I had to start checking his assignments with him every day. When I got home, I had to be like in the in Google Classroom because he didn't actually know how to do that. I also had to help him sort through his emails. He was getting updates from every Google Classroom assignment. So his email's filling up, he's getting overwhelmed. Uh, I e helped him email his teachers. We worked through how to send a professional email to ask for help. Um, and I believed what I saw, not what I was told. He was telling me he was doing all his assignments and that everything was great, but he wasn't wanting to go to school and he wasn't spending any time doing his assignments. Uh, and then I also got him a math tutor. He really did need that extra support in math. Uh, and with my daughter, we just use a lot of extra mastery oriented feedback. Uh, so that's it, guys. I have some resources in here, which are just, this is UDL, the framework, if you're interested. This is a free book on UDL. Uh, these are some uh, supports for parents um, who, um, you know, in, in New Hampshire, UDL-based supports. And then also uh, Mary Lane at the um, Bureau of Special Education in New Hampshire. If you're really struggling with learning loss, she's a great contact there. So that is it. I'm going to stop sharing, Jack. Okay, there you go. Great. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, I, I found that presentation uh, fascinating and relevant, and I appreciate so much how you uh, shared examples from your own life and your own kids, um, because that also provides a perfect segue to introduce Christina Klee. Um, Christina is a quality manager at the WS Badger Company in Keene, and uh, mother of four, uh, two boys, seven and five, and then two-year-old twins, a uh, boy and a girl, who uh, have gone through, uh, from what Christine was telling me, a range of remote learning and hybrid learning and in-person learning uh, over the past year. So, um, Christina, I'll, I'll let you take it away and just share a little bit uh, with us about your experiences over the past year. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it, Jack. And Amanda, yes, your presentation was fabulous. A lot of things that I can think about as a parent and apply. So I'm super excited. Um, yeah, so as Jack mentioned, I am a mother of four. And since March of last year, our kids were in remote with everybody else. Um, they did do well for a while. I have a five-year-old who was in preschool at the time, so he wasn't doing any classes. Um, and then my first grader at the time was sitting right next to me while I was trying to work and we had a baby gate and we were trying to keep the two-year-old twins in a sp certain spot of the house and have kids doing remote learning and then trying to work. And then my husband was across from me trying to work. It was a madhouse, um, but somehow we survived it. And, you know, like reflecting on it at this point, the kids did fairly well. They learned, you know, the, the teachers did the best they could do and they provided the the information that was critical, but at the point where they were in the school, they had not much left to learn to get them to the next grade. They had gotten so far in school. So starting this um, most recently in, in the fall, we elected to keep the kids in the remote learning. Um, and that was putting my kind now kindergartner in 
school for the first time, never knowing what school was like on a screen, <laughs> you know, for six hours a day. And his teacher was fabulous. She was excellent. Um, she did the best she could with some five-year-olds, you know, trying to sit still and keep their body, you know, their, their self aware. And um, she worked really well with them and he learned a lot. And I, I think that he came from a Montessori preschool. And so he had a leg up in learning. So he was missing the social aspects. She and I would talk about how the, the, the pieces that he would need to work on were kind of more his big feelings and dealing with certain things about having a brother like next door doing classwork with him and brothers and sisters like down the you know down the hall and mom and dad like he's having more feelings and social like issues versus not being able to learn the math and write his numbers and letters um, for a kindergartner and my second grader just got burnt out really fast. He just didn't want to do it anymore. As much as he was involved in, yeah, screens, screens, screens. Now you're giving me screens, screens, screens all the time. He was just like, I don't want to do this. My dad's now my teacher. My dad's now my um, my dad. And like, I can't get away from anybody. And so it's the funny thing. You, you see a loss in just that separation from being like, hey, you had this great day at school and you had these friends and you had these connections. And now all of those connections just live with you 24 hours a day. So it was, it was hard. Um, they just recently went back to school. And on day one, they were at my bed right next to me at 6.01, ready to go to school, like backpacks on, dressed. Like I could never have done that the, like the, the years before. It was a struggle to get everybody out the door and at the bus stop on time. And so they were just so excited and they've pretty much remained the same since they've been going back in um, for about a month or so. But it's just, I think that they've lost the social skills, like the social awareness, and they really have been excited to do that and go back. I am um, also on the board at the Montessori Schoolhouse here in um, on Hurricane Road. And a woman that is on our board wrote to me, because I was just asking like, what are concerns and what have people seen? and she said that the skills that she thinks that her daughter has lost is the social interaction. So things like taking turns and not interrupting while someone else talks and how to react when things don't go her way are probably what she's seeing, which applies, I think, to a lot of people. Like they just have not had those interactions um, to continue that way and not as much of the concern as the, the um, learning loss. It's just like a, a little different to think about it for those kids that haven't had that kind of learning loss. They've had social skill learning loss. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to hoping that everything opens back up safely and that we get kids back to on-site learning because it's it's the best for parents. It's the best for kids. I mean, it's absolutely the best for kids. My kids definitely have done much better in the few weeks that they've been back at school. Um, Christina, I just want to say that uh, the high, you know, my husband teaches at the high school in town and he said it, he's loved, he calls it the honeymoon phase right now, but all the high school kids just want to be in school. Like, everybody's like excited to be in person. They want to see their friends. They want to be learning, you know? So I think I, I totally, I guess I totally understand totally understand what you're saying about your kids being like, come on, let's take us to school. Like, you, know, you know, maybe one of the outcomes is an appreciation for, for school in a new way, you know? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, it's a, like we call it the honeymoon phase. You know, you don't know how long it will last, but but it is nice to see. You know, it's good to talk about with kids. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, thank you to both of you so much for for your your really thoughtful presentations. Uh, we do already have a couple of, of questions in the chat. Uh, and the the first one is is one that I love because we, we really do want this uh, session to be able to provide really tangible, specific takeaways for for parents who tune in. And so, uh, Amanda, the first question is is directed towards you, uh, related to one of the last things you you spoke about the master mastery oriented feedback. Um, so Gina asked, uh, could you please give some some examples of master mastery oriented feedback for elementary school aged kids? Yeah, and. Christina, that's your age group, right? The kid, you're, so you have a, you said a nine-year-old, is that right? They're five and seven, so they're kindergarten and second grade. 
Okay. So your second grader. So, you know, I'm thinking about like, you know, I have to, so I have a four-year-old and a 17 year old. So I'm just trying to remember what they're, what I'm doing right now is trying to remember what they're learning in second grade, but right. uh, yeah. So I'm just going to generally say like they're that, what, some math concepts. So what math concepts are they like learning right now? Probably. He's doing like greater than less than he's doing, um, you know, just like counting. I'm trying to think of where he is. Um, my husband was the teacher. Yeah, no, don't worry. Greater than less than is perfect. Cause you know, let's say your, your son or daughter comes home and I'm just using you as an example. Cause as I said, I can't remember what they're learning in second. So is uh, this idea that let's say they come home and there's a test and they uh, it's on greater than or less than, and, and maybe your son has done really well and he has a 95%. So some mastery oriented feedback, what it would not look like is good job. You did great on that test because that tells us like, oh, you're smart or you, you're smart, that's why you did well, right? So what you could say is uh, something like, wow, great job. I saw you studying more for that test than the last test. Like, what did you do differently, right? And so now you're getting them to think about like, oh yeah, I mastered this by, by doing this other thing or I, I knew how I needed to learn. So that's why I did better. Uh, mastery oriented feedback also, when you, you don't just focus like, so sometimes we can also zero in on like, the problem, right? Oh, oh, let's say he came home, your son, this is not going to happen to him, but he came home and he got, you know, a five, per, you know, he only got 5% right, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of, instead of saying, like, oh, you, you know, you should have tried harder. Like, why didn't you focus or what, you know, what went, you know, what went wrong? It's really saying like, oh, maybe uh, there's a concept here that you missed. Like, let's go back and, and think about, you know, what concept can, can we understand better? Because there's not, you know, we know you're good at math. It's just, maybe you missed this this concept that's important in, in greater than or less than it's, it's not about you. It's about, you know, maybe you didn't quite pick up this concept, which is normal. Everybody misses concepts, you know? So it's sort of like this idea you want to make the feedback. Oh, you also want to make it timely. So it would definitely not be useful if you're, if your son did poorly on a test and you found it like two weeks after the test while you're digging through his backpack, if he's like mine was, and, and you pull it out and you like have a, you know, you're upset with him or whatever, this is not going to be useful because the feedback is not timely. Now they've moved on to another concept, right? So mastery oriented feedback needs to be growth oriented. How can it help the student grow? It needs to be timely. Uh, and, and ideally it's, uh, it's about effort. I think that's the biggest takeaway. Like you want to focus on the student's effort, not their like innate ability, you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, we've got a, a pair of questions in the chat from Terry, and I'll, I'll start with the, the most recent one, which is for you, Christina. Uh, Terry asked, how have you changed as a parent during the pandemic, and how do you think this will help your children learn in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I didn't think I was capable of doing all the things <laughs> um, at once. We've... Um, We've had to have more patience. We've dug into being more able to coax the, the learning and, you know, guiding the engagement of using the screens for learning and then learning on like, you know, going and sitting down with a book and reading versus like having to read on the screens. Um, you know, I think I have, I know at the beginning we had I was like, oh my gosh, I just need a break. Even though everybody's been on the screen, like I just, I need everybody to go back on a screen and have a break. So I can just have a mental sprint space to like take that usual 15 minute ride home from work. Like I can't get that break from everybody in the house. And so then it just kind of escalated, right? It was like, oh, this is really nice. And like, oh, they're, they're watching TV during dinner time. And this is like, oh, I can like have some space to myself. And now it's like, oh, right. Like I need to come back out of that. So we're kind of on this other side, like coming out of that hill so we can get the kids back into the routine of not watching TV at these specific times, having family engagement, because it just kind of fell out the door. So I think it was like we're becoming more aware of what we've done. Like we did what we need to do to survive. And then it's like, okay, we're coming out of survival mode. Like we're back into, okay, this is the way we want to raise our children with X amount of screen time and X amount of, you know, like this you know, categorization of time. I think it's changed. I actually went back into work and took a new job um, back in September. So it changed a lot of things for our family. We had to bring in a nanny into our house um, to help us with 
the transition so that my husband wasn't here with four kids <laughs> alone because that was quite a bit. Um, you know, there's just been a lot of give and take. And I think that we've grown in communication with each other and we've grown to know when we need our personal spaces and we've grown to know that we still have to take that time to recoup as parents um, and even just going on hikes and getting outside and getting the kids outside and I'm glad to see the warmer weather because that was hard in the winter to to deal with but um, yeah I'm not sure if I even answered the question but that's what I have to say. <laughs> no I, I thought that was a great answer Christina and you know it's funny at one point um, in May right when the pandemic came out you know March and then in May I told my husband oh I'm, I'm gonna buy a puppy right I did all I did all the COVID things just so you know. <laughs> I'm gonna buy a puppy and he said oh, great. That's cool. And I said, yeah, it's in Montana. So I'm going to get in my friend's RV and I'm going to social distance and drive to Montana to get this puppy. And he said, well, why are you doing that? I said, because the great thing about COVID has been all this time as a family. And the horrible thing about COVID has been all this time as a family. And I really want to miss you guys. I really, <laughs> I think it'd be really great and healthy for our family if I could miss you a little bit, you know? So yes, I went to Montana and got a puppy, but I, I guess I'm just saying like, I, I feel like I feel like all people, especially people who had young kids, but all people who had, who had kids and tried to work and raise their kids at home during COVID have a, there's like a special kind of, you know, like, like we need some kind of like detox or therapies because it was really hard. I just want to say that was really hard. And if I was to answer that question, I would just say, I've learned to let my son do some childcare. So uh, now my husband and I, <laughs> literally go and sit in the car in the driveway and get takeout and, you know, do a Friday night and let my 17 year old watch the four year old. Cause you know, before I wouldn't have done that, but now I was so desperate to have, you know, time sort of to myself. So yeah. that's all I want. I just want to say, I hear you sister. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Uh, and then we, we've got a, a, a pair of questions here that I'll, I'll kind of synthesize into one because they're on, on similar uh, topics, which is uh, for both of you, really. And it's about uh, focusing on kind of the impact of this on on teachers. Uh, and so from T Terry says, what do you think the impact has been on teachers and their confidence in their abilities to teach and teach well? And uh, kind of going off of that too, uh, just, you know, what do you think teachers might have learned during all of this? And what would you want them to consider as they incorporate the experiences of the past year into their teaching moving forward? Do you, you want me to go first, Jack, or do you want Christina? Either one. Uh, I think, Amanda, the first one was directed towards you, so I mean, okay. you wanted to. Uh, I'll just say that, um, you know, I think COVID did help us see that there are some really, really, uh, you know, harmful inequities <laughs> in the education system. And, you know, kids who had parents who were as ma amazing as Christina, you know, they fared better, right? And kids who had parents who you know, ha had to go into work or were a single parent and they had to go and they didn't have, you know, though there, that was, that's really hard, right? And so there was some massive inequities and then also kids who had internet versus kids who don't, we still have a substantial portion of st students in New Hampshire who don't have, you know, home internet access. So I guess I just want to say like, I hope we don't forget that, that, that that happened. And I hope that we can think about that um, the other thing is, I, I do want to say, like, I think, tr like, I love that Christina said her son's uh, kindergarten teacher tried so hard and that she appreciated it, because I do think teachers tried really hard. I, I really do think that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that what I hope for teachers is maybe that they take away that the learning is, is very social emotional. That's what Christina was, you know, what you were alluding to was this idea that kids missed out on the, the social aspect and, you know, I would wish for them that they could be maybe like a burden could be lifted and they don't have to feel as content heavy as maybe that other piece, you know, and I, and I would want that gift for them. Cause I think during COVID teachers got there cause there, it was hard to teach content. And so they really were focused on, you know, how are you guys doing today? Like what, you know, what's going happening in your, show us your pets, right? Like, or whatever, you know? Um, so I just wish that we could keep that 
I, I wish we could learn about the, and reduce the inequities. And the last thing maybe I'll just say is accessibility. So unfortunately during COVID, or fortunately, a lot of teachers learn about accessibility, right? Because if you have a student who's, who's deaf, who is on Zoom, how are you gonna put them in a breakout room and have them like listen to their peer, right? If you have a student who's blind and you're doing a PowerPoint, how are they gonna be like learning uh, uh, you know, through Zoom? So I think uh, accessibility was brought to the forefront, which makes me really happy because I think the more we can design environments that are beneficial to everyone, it, it benefits everyone, right? So it's kind of like that idea of, this is the last thing I'll say, Christina, sorry, the grocery store, you know, those doors that open and shut automatically, they were designed for people who have mobility issues. But when I'm pushing my stroller with like my kid and my older kid, I'm trying to hold the groceries, they benefit me as well. So I just want to say, if we can design for people who are in the margins and make sure it's accessible, it benefits everyone. And so, so yeah, so my three things are just, you know, we need to think about the inequities and not bring them back if we can. We need to make sure we're continuing to design accessibly. And I would hope that teachers could focus as much as they were before on social emotional and that we don't get bogged down with like content. Not that content's not important. <laughs> Those are my wishes. So I'll, to you, Christina, over to you. <laughs> yeah, I, um, you know, speaking from, again, yeah, we are very fortunate on the, the aspect that we have we had the ability to have our kids have internet access. They didn't have to, like, we didn't have to worry about any sort of learning disabilities at this point. Like maybe there are some that we haven't uncovered, but in walking with some of the women um, in my neighborhood, there was a woman's daughter who's dyslexic. And so she has specific reading um, and they had built up, you know, this pattern and this um, skill level and it quickly diminished during COVID. And um, I just remember hearing the, you know, she would talk about it on the walks because clearly that's extremely important to her, you know, how her daughter is functioning at school and, and or not. Um, so it was interesting to hear those kinds of things um, from somebody that, I, you know, in a, in a place where I wasn't even really sure what was happening. I, um, you know, everybody got thrown into this and the teacher that we had um, for first grade last year, she was wonderful, but she was, and she did great at figuring it out and like getting the Google Classroom put together and eventually you're right, they started asking like for sharing days and like to give kids the ability to connect instead of just, okay, we've got to get this content to you. We've just got to get this, like, you've got to understand your foundations and you've got to understand how to put syllables together and you've got to be able to clap this thing out and you've got to be able to count by twos or, you know, whatever it is that they have to do. Um, and I remember when my kindergartner started and the woman that um, was teaching him she just, she, she figured that out like right away. Like she was, she was a, a very experienced teacher and just took the same things that she was, could do in the class and apply them as, as much as she could to the classroom in the Google classroom and on the meets. And she separated her classes. So they were less kids in the group and they could interact better. Um, and then she even would take smaller groups and put them together. Like my son and one other kid were in the, like the same um, like math and reading level. So they would like do these like 15 or 20 minute sessions together. So they became close friends and they were also because they like knew the same concepts they weren't waiting on each other to answer questions or, you know, feeling kind of like, oh, I'm done. And I'm kind of like twiddling my fingers or for anybody else that's struggling and like hearing kids that like, you know, it's like they were just, she said, even it out. So I think teachers, you know, it took some time but they, they definitely got it together and like figured out really great patterns on how to do this. And I do think that um, it would be great to see like snow days be, you know, optionally available if possible to not have, you know, to have some content available and not to have to count it as a snow day going forward and to have some of these things that we are able to do um, remotely be, you know, accessible so that we can keep our sh years shorter and not have to go so far into the, the summers like we have in the past if it's accessible, like you said, but it needs to be available for all the people to be able to do that and um so how do we get that that's yeah a great question i think that's great christina and i also you know that you reminded me of something covid really made parents co-teachers right like right. in a way that we i think i was very used to like putting my kids you know putting her in preschool putting her in school and then oh i'll check the homework when they come home but i'm not like teaching them you know <laughs> right. and so you know now we had to really become co-teachers and uh, my husband tells these great stories of calling and 
calling a parent and saying, your kid's not online. And then the kids, the parent says, I'll take care of that. And you can hear the shower door, like pull open. And the parent's like, get out of the shower. Mr. Ewing's on the phone. You need to be in your Zoom class, you know? So, uh, oops, I probably shouldn't have said his name. Well, it doesn't matter. So, um, so that, so I just am saying like, you know, it does, I hope we don't lose that also. I hope we can like stay in this place where we are like helping teachers do their job and teachers are helping us by like letting us know how we can help kids at home or whatever, you know? Yeah. More collaborative, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And can I ask you both to maybe expand on, on that theme of what aspects of the educational environment over the past year that you think have maybe actually been a little bit more beneficial for your children and, and what aspects of, uh, of education during the pandemic you might want to see uh, last beyond the pandemic? I, I know, Amanda, you said, obviously, we want to work to eliminate the inequities that the pandemic has highlighted, but of the, of the various aspects, uh, both maybe practical and on a bigger level of what we've seen during the pandemic, what would you hope to, to see continue? Well, I have this crazy answer to that. It's, I asked my son this question and he said, nothing except we got him this math tutor and she was based in Colorado and she's a uh, former, she, well, she's my best friend's da daughter who's now, you know, skiing in Colorado, whatever. And she helped him so much. And he said that this one Zoom was a great one-on-one -on -one tutoring tool. So what, like, what would happen if we, if we somehow strategically set tutoring up as far as peer to peer tutoring, or we had like, you know, we, now that we're all comfortable using Zoom, I think we could really use that in, in a way for, for like one-on-one -on -one catching kids up. Like I've heard that a lot of teachers don't want to teach in the summer because they're pretty burnt out. So there's like a struggle potentially to get summer school going just because there's not a lot of people volunteering to do that. So, you know, is there a way to, uh, do tutoring over the summer for kids in a reduced, you know, at no cost or with their peers or with, you know, creative credits for them. I don't know. I just, I do feel like that one-on-one -on -one learning a concept uh, on Zoom really did help my son who has executive uh, functioning uh, struggles. So I think that was a benefit of, of remote learning. Um, that's what I got right now, Christina, but maybe Oh, wait, I will say one more thing. I think some kids who were bullied a little bit in person found that being on Zoom, they could share their answer and not feel that they were like, you know, being attacked or being uh, uh, outed or being ostracized or whatever. Um, and so I don't know if there's a way to think about making sure that those kids feel safe or utilizing Zoom. I don't know. Those are my two thoughts. Okay, now I'm done. Yeah, it's funny. My um, my other friend that uh, I work with that lives in my neighborhood, she has a seventh grader, and she, she said that he actually benefited from being at home, based on how awful middle school is, like just from the peer relationships that happen. So she said that he had these really beautiful friendships that were in the neighborhood with these kids that they would see each other, um, socially distant, mask, like biking around, and they would they were. Um, enjoying that and that she said that this group of friends that he had here was really great because they were kind of different ages they weren't just in his level age um because she was like you don't I don't know if you remember but middle school is awful she's like just wait just wait till your kids get there she's like it's awful <laughs> and so um I think there's like you know there was some benefit there for him like he's going into eighth grade coming into this next fall and she's like I think he's excited to go back and be at the top but like it's, you know, those sixth and seventh grade years were going to, were pretty struggle, um, a big struggle. I think, you know, looking at my kids and what they've done, um, things that could stay, you know, a lot of the programs that they got access to that weren't always free. I think they got a lot of free access to programs for reading and math and different things like that. Um, you know, they keep the kids engaged on a computer and, it's funny, like they really do learn well. And um, the reading one that my son was doing, if, if he stumbled upon a word, it would read it to him. And so it would like help him pronounce the word. And then he would get quizzed at the end and he like gets these points and these stars or something. And he was like, oh, this is like really fun. Like here's like, I conceptually learned this thing and I applied it. 
Um, and he's like, I want to do more because like if I get more, I get these badges. Like there's kind of like an incentive there, um, you know, to read. But it was he also got to choose different things. Um, like he's more of somebody that wants to know like, OK, I want to know about space and I want to know about science and I want to know about like real things that happened in history. Like he doesn't want to just read kind of um, arbitrary things. He doesn't want to read fiction. He wants to read nonfiction. Um, and so she would they would set him up with these different things that he could read articles on. So it was could be more tied to what he was actually engaged in reading. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was helpful. And he could like listen to it, read it to him. Then he would read it out loud to us. And then if he, yeah, I could tell you how many times and what kind of words he was not getting, which I think was helpful. Um, Cause you don't always get that if you're in a classroom with a bunch of kids trying to read. And I'm trying to think of other things that they've done. Um, you know, the, the kindergarten, most of the stuff she was doing with them was, you know, having them play outside if they weren't on the screens. It was like, here's 10 different craft activities that you can do to like learn your shapes and to learn your colors and to do these things. And I think that was really great that she was pushing, you know, here's two hours, do these crafts, do these activities. And they're learning things, but they're not like so down the path of just thinking about you're conceptually sitting at a screen learning and somebody's teaching you. So that was kind of cool too. Just those, sending those things home even too for parents is like great. Cause I can always use more craft ideas and things that are educational and not just go make a mess out of glue and sticks. Yeah, yeah. And I hear you saying the word, I, I would like kind of phrase it as like personalizing the learning. Yeah. So for your son, it's like, this is what he's interested in reading. Let's find some articles on that. I think. Well, you know, research tells us that is how kids, that's how everyone likes to learn. We like to learn something that we're interested in. So I think if we, if, if, you know, remote teaching and remote learning helped us see that, helped us as educators see that we can include more personalization in our lessons and in our, you know, use more resources and that kids are going to learn if they, because there's this like, you know, sort of misnomer, like if kids have cell phones, <laughs> if kids, you know, go online, they're going to just search the internet and do go on YouTube and whatever. So, but I think if we've learned that we've had to learn that kids can actually learn when they have access to the World Wide web. Uh, and uh, so I think that's like a good takeaway uh, for us to think about. And the cell phone, I mean, it's a game changer for kids who have, who have disabilities, right? Like with students who have dyslexia, they have note takers on their cell phone. They can take a screenshot of of a, um, a handout and have it read aloud to them. There's all these apps that can really make things accessible. So, you know, here's for maybe having teachers have a little more confidence that they can bring some of that technology in the classroom and not have it backfire. Yeah. Well, building on that kind of theme of personalization, uh, Amanda, we have another uh, question in the chat for you, which is, a, again, a great, like, really specific kind of uh, feedback kind of question. So uh, the question is, aside from using mastery-oriented feedback, how can you help your kids understand how they learn? Yeah, so I would actually tell kids that the brain is an organ that uh, has pl pl neuroplasticity. And I think no matter how young your kids are, you can explain this in a way that like, you know, is interesting to them. And that neuroplasticity means your brain can like learn new things and it's not limited in what it can learn and how it can learn, right? So I would really go, go into the science of like, you, you have this amazing brain and when you first learn something, it's going to be uncomfortable, right? So you can think about skateboarding or bike riding or whatever activity is they've, that they've done that, Maybe they weren't successful the first few times if they play an instrument and then they got better and better. Everything is like, you can learn everything in that way, right? You can learn math that way. You can learn writing, reading, all those things that way. So I guess I would just really, you know, I would dive into the science with them and I would say your brain is amazing and it takes this many repetitions to learn. And it's, you know, exciting if, you know, I always go, go to science too, as like a way to um, you know, tell my kids what not to do too. So it's, you know, you're, you're not mature enough. Your brain is not ready for that. So, you know, um, so I guess maybe that's where I always go, but I think that it's good to talk to kids about like, help them understand that being, you know, getting things right or doing well is not just this, it's not a raw innate talent. That's what I want to say. So you can tell them about a time you failed and you learned and you overcame that. You can talk about things that were hard for you and you're glad you persevered through, um, you know, just really try to like 
get rid of that misnomer that there's like smart people in the world. And then there's people who aren't smart. And that's just how it is. You know, they used to tell me, Amanda, you're not good at math. And I believed it, you know? And so I just really think the more we can tell kids that, you know, they to help them have this growth mindset. And that Ted talk that I shared in the slideshow, it, it is worth watching. I mean, she really goes into the science behind, you know, kids who have a growth mindset, you know, kids who have fixed mindset are more likely to cheat. They said, if they were, if they couldn't do well, then they would be more likely to cheat because doing well was so important and they didn't think that they could get it wrong and learn from it, right? They thought that you just had to get it right. You were just a smart person or, or a not smart person, you know? <clears throat> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's, um, we have a, like a list of things um, upstairs of, like, that we read, like we've got rules in the house and we've got like different statements and one of them is you know it's okay if you don't get it right the first time you just have to keep applying yourself and the trying like you just nobody's going to get everything right the first time they did it that doesn't mean that like how would we have light and electricity and how would we have these things and cars and you know how would we do all this stuff and my kids are always like well how can we create this robot and I'm like great like how can we do it like let's apply what we know and then try it and then figure out what fails and then try again um is that like you know, don't give up and keep applying. Yeah. And I, and I, so I want to tell you guys this really quick story. Is that okay? If I, yes. So, so there's the, uh, so this is an interesting story because I think sometimes it's not, it's like we keep trying, but if we get more people in the room with us to like brainstorm with us, or we try with other people, or sometimes this random person will help us. So uh, in Alaska, they, the telephone lines, right, fill with ice and break and like hang down. And it's really problematic because they have winter all the time. And People are getting injured all the time, the uh, line workers, as they're trying to, um, I can share this article with Cecily and she can put it with this video, but uh, they're getting injured because they're having to climb up and, you know, it's, it's hard work and it costs a lot of money, a lot of manpower. So they decide to get everyone in the company to into this room and they're just going to brainstorm ideas and they're not coming up with any. And, uh, and this one guy says, you know, uh, the other day I was climbing up the pole and I saw this bear. It was so scary. And somebody else jokes around and says, yeah, what if we could hang stakes from the poles and the bears could shake, you know, the poles and that would solve our problem. All the ice would fall off. And the secretary who's in the other, you know, on the other side of the room, she says, oh, you know, uh, in, I remember in Vietnam, the helicopters used to fly really low and they would shake the trees, right? And the trees would shake. And they, that's how they do it now. They fly the helicopters really low and it shakes the poles and it shakes the wires and all the ice falls up. The reason I love this story is like, it's not, sometimes you have to say that wrong answer about the bears, even though you knew it was like the wrong answer, caused the right answer to come out. So I just want to like sort of preface that it's, you know, it's also, it's, you try all these things like Edison, right? He invented 99 ways not to invent the light bulb or whatever. Sometimes you also like, just say the wrong answer and it gives someone the right answer. So, you know, wrong answers can be good. That's what I want to say, you know? Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> I know I sort of butchered that, but I'll share that article with Cecily so she can put it in here, but that is actually what happened, you know? Well, and Amanda, as Christina was talking, I couldn't help but feel like the uh, sign that is visible in, in the background of your screen uh, oh, yeah. is quite relevant, which is that we, we can do hard things. Yeah. And the, um, other, and the other sign I have is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, Jack, just so you know, you know. Um, so we've got just about five minutes left. And I, I did just want to ask one last question of the both of you, which is uh, tilting at the theme of our uh, third and final of these events, which is a week from tonight. Um, and it's something, Amanda, that you touched on a little bit earlier, which is this summer. Um, so to both of you as parents, uh, what are you looking for out of this summer? How are you hoping, planning to keep your kids uh, engaged and active? And uh, I guess going with the theme of, of tonight's event, uh, what, if anything, is there to be done over the summer to kind of gauge uh, you know, the impact of this, this school year and, and how to use that to inform your approach to the coming school year. You want to, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a big question. 
Um, I mean, I think I, you know, personally, I, I, I want to see my husband relax a little bit. He's, a, as I said, he's a teacher and I think it's been pretty stressful. Uh, I want to see my kids relax too. Uh, you know, I, I, of course, research is my thing. So I will say that they did this very extended uh, research a lo a longitudinal study in England. Uh, and they found out that the, the um, biggest negative impact on education is poverty, but you can address uh, the negative impacts in three very simple ways. Uh, give your kids a bedtime, read books with them and eat dinner as a family. So whenever I'm feeling like kind of a suck, like a horrible parent, uh, cause I've been letting them watch TV for two hours or whatever. I just tell myself, well, at least I'm, we ate dinner as a family. They have a bedtime and I'll read them books, you know? So I just want to like leave people with that, I guess. Like you can really, really positively and, and actually undo the harmful effects uh, that poverty can have with like those three sort of basic tenets, you know? I think that those are very well applied to just anybody that's feeling any sort of stress in this, like in COVID is just like, you know, we're surviving and we're doing the best we can. And if I have a dinner that I sit down with my family and I give them some attention before they go to sleep and read with them and or snuggle or cuddle or listen to what they're doing or give them a bath or whatever those things are. Yeah. I think there's just that like, okay, like we're still in this together. We're here. We're, you know, we're all going to make it through. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, having my kids go to, I've got them signed up to go to MoCo, which is, um, they only run that like four weeks out of the summer, um, just so that we've got something that they're doing for some amount of the time, but then also looking at giving them a break from having to be um, in school. And we, um, we have a boat, so we're going to go boating. Um, we're going to take a vacation of some sort and, you know, kind of just really spend some time and enjoy the outside. And um, we've got a, like I said before, we have a, a, a wonderful um, woman that's a nanny that helps us with the kids. So I think we're gonna take advantage of just having her with us for the summer. And, um, you know, I think when the fall comes and they go back in, we'll, you know, there'll be assessments. You know, the teachers will take into account what they, what they know, what they don't know, they'll figure out I've always seen the way that they do, um, you know, they kind of take some time and they figure out which group of kids is in like a similar pat, like a similar um, comprehensive pattern, you know, like knows the same kind of skills and has that and they can kind of group those kids together and then they um, work with them. And I know that they've done that with my other, my first son that went through um, for first grade, you know, they would set kind of wait a little bit and see where their reading comprehension is and like see where their math skills are. And then they would kind of, you know, have those kids together and then see where those improvements are or where they can advance in other ways. And just like, I think they'll be able to assess those things. And, um, you know, they're, they're able to do that in person. I think the teachers we had this year were really great on remote and they eventually figured it out. It just took longer. It like, it just took a little bit longer because it's just takes time. Um, if you're not in person seeing everybody five days a week. So I think we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, well, uh, Amanda, you were definitely correct when you said uh, that's a big question that I asked and probably not the best one to ask with, with just five minutes left. But that is why it is the entire theme of our uh, final session, which is a week from tonight, 6.30 um, next Thursday. Uh, the Just a little teaser for it. The title of it is The Summer of Our Discontent, What's Ahead for Busy Parents? Um, so the link to sign up for that, as well as everything uh, related to the Sentinels Pandemic Parenting Series, including uh, the link to this recording uh, in the near future uh, is at sentinelsource.com backslash pandemic underscore parenting. Um, thank you so much to Amanda and Christina for joining us. Thank you to everyone who has joined uh, tonight and shared questions. Uh, and thank you as well to those who tune in after the fact. We hope that you uh, find this as uh, engaging and as helpful and as thoughtful as I think all of us did here tonight. So um, thanks again to everyone for joining us and have a great night.